All right, in this video, we're gonna introduce a technique for finding the lengths of curves over an integral. For instance, in this case, I have a function. It's important to note that the function needs to be differentiable and the derivative needs to be continuous. And importantly, because we're gonna be using the derivative to be making this calculation. So what the game is, if I started at some point at the beginning of the interval on this function and traveled along the curve to the end of the interval, we want to investigate and figure out how far I've traveled. Well, at this point in the game, you probably know what we're going to do. The first thing we're going to do is create some subintervals here. I'll just break this up into four subintervals just to illustrate the point here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to investigate one of these. Let's just call this right here the ith interval. So this is xi minus one, this is xi. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate the distance between these two points on these interval right here with a straight line. And obviously, as with all of this work that we're doing with integrals, if I did this on each of these intervals, well, since I have just four intervals on this big interval right here, this would be a pretty dang bad approximation. But if we consider the fact when we have an infinite number of intervals, or as the number of intervals goes to infinity specifically, these little lengths right here will accurately measure the curve. All right, first things first, I want to zoom in on this area right here and investigate a formula for calculating this distance between these endpoints on the function for a given interval. So given a representative interval here, again, I'm trying to calculate this distance directly between these two points. So if I were to write this right here, so what do I do? We always do is we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem. You could also use the distance formula for this. It's exactly the same. But the question is, are what are these measures right here? This gap right here is the size of the interval. We call this delta x, right? That's the representative size of each of the intervals given the number of subintervals we have right here. This distance right here, we could call f of xi minus one minus f of xi right here for this gap. But just for the purposes, and you'll see how we're gonna use this, I'm just gonna call this a change in y. So then given that setup, this approximating distance on this interval, again, I'm approximating this curve here with this straight line. Um, what this distance would be is the y squared or delta y squared, actually this distance squared, excuse me, is delta y squared plus delta x squared. So then taking the square root of both sides of this gives us this statement right here. Um, so I have the distance for the interval, or this approximate distance is the square root of delta y squared plus delta x squared. The trick is right now what I'm going to do is I'm actually gonna multiply by a factor of one, a tricky factor of one here. I'm gonna multiply by delta x squared or the square root of delta, delta x squared times the square root of delta x squared. And the reason I'm using this square root notation here is so that I can actually interact this factor with these right here. What I can do now is move this factor underneath and actually distribute this factor to both of these. Importantly, under the square root, this is just a delta x squared. So let me write this out and show you what this looks like. So there's the trick. I moved in that division of the square root of delta x squared. I'm dividing now both of these terms by that delta x squared. I have to leave this square root of delta x squared on the outside, and you'll see the use of that in one second. It's important for the move of integration. But inside here, so then what I have now is for this first term here, I'm going to rewrite this as delta y over delta x squared and then this right here is just a plus one. And then on the outside here, the square root of delta x squared, that just gives me a delta x. All right, and then we're going to use our good friend, the mean value theorem. Going back to this statement, delta y over delta x. Again, for this given interval, what that is, the rate of the change over the interval, the delta y over delta x, it's the slope between these two lines right here. What the mean value theorem says, if we have a continuous differentiable function on an interval here, then there exists a point somewhere on the interval so that the slope of that point is the same as the slope of the, the endpoints right here. So again, the mean value theorem says for any given interval like this, there absolutely exists 
an xi we'll call, we'll call xi star that represents that slope. Again, just to take a second to appreciate this mean value theorem, we've used it a couple times in really important points this quarter. It's an extremely powerful theorem, and we saw it back in differential calculus. And just to, I know I'm going to repeat probably too much, but it's really important. The fact that we have a continuous function on an interval here, we know the slope of the secant line connecting the endpoints of that integral. When we find that value, there must be at least one point on that interval that has that same slope. Or in other words, if we take the derivative at that point, we'll get this as we define delta y over delta x to be that slope. So then that statement lets us replace that delta y over delta x for this interval right here with this statement right here. So if we get this, this distance, this estimated distance of the curve on this interval is the square root of f prime of this xi star that we got squared plus one, and then we also have this delta x. And before we get to the punchline, I just want to review the main part of that trick, which was right here. The fact that we multiply by this factor of one of the square root of delta x squared over delta x squared. That really did two things for us. The first one, we get, it got to this point right here where we could use the mean value theorem. The second and important too is the fact that we get out this delta x. When you look at this statement right here, I'm hoping at this point you've gotten comfortable with, well, if we want to implement integration, we've got to have this statement times some small change in x, because that's what integration does. It's this, it's a summation of these little pieces multiplied by delta x that we're applying a limit to. So then this statement again, this will approximate for our ith interval, this distance on the curve. It, you know, it's pretty bad when we have a few, but the more of these we get, the better this approximation is for each of these intervals. So then if we take the summation of these lengths over the entire interval for however many n of these little intervals that we choose, we'll just sum up all these little lengths, which will give us an approximation. And as always in this class, the idea is yes, the more n we get, the better, the better this approximation be, the smaller the gaps of those intervals will be, so each of these will estimate better and better the actual length of the curve. But heck, what's better than having, having the number of, of intervals go to infinity? And so we're going to do that, and you will see that we have this Riemann sum now, and this right here will give us the exact length of the curve over the interval. And we know at this point too, when we apply the limit to a Riemann sum, we get this definite integral. So this right here translates the definite integral from a to b of the square root of f prime of x squared. Importantly, this is the derivative. We got that piece from the mean value theorem plus one dx. So here's just a summary of what was just proved. Um, importantly in this case, f needs to be differentiable and f prime needs to be continuous on this interval. So that's something that you want to keep in, in your mind as you do this. Um, but we can find the arc length given this setup right here. Again, it's from a to b over the interval, the square root of the derivative of the, of the function squared plus one. And before I get started, I just want to say this. It's really important with this, this arc length problems is rarely is it going to be easy to actually evaluate the arc length by hand. The nature of this is really gnarly. And at first you might be thinking, that's not so bad. I can find some tricks. But for example, if you're given an interesting function at all, um, you can't use any u substitution because you don't have these factors on the outside. Sometimes you can use trig substitution as you'll see, um, but often what we end up doing with this is we'll use the integral to set this up and then we'll use either approximation techniques or, or a computer system to actually evaluate this definite integral. All right, let's check this one out. So in this case right here, I have f of x equals x squared on the interval from zero to two. So my first move is going to be to find f prime of x. So f prime of x is two x. Just a quick check here. This is obviously a continuous function on this interval and this is differentiable everywhere. It's a polynomial, so everything is good. 
So then let's set this up. I know that the length of this curve is the integral from zero to two of the square root of two x squared plus one dx. And so all I've done from here to here is just apply that square to that term, and then I just switch these around. You'll see why I did that in one second. But as you look at this integral, um, hopefully at this point, it's important that you're looking at this and thinking, okay, what techniques can I throw at this to attack this? Well, u substitution for this part isn't going to work out too well because I don't have a factor of x on the outside. Um, this actually is ripe for a trig substitution, which we absolutely could do. Um, I previously tried that and was contemplating showing you that work. Um, but in the end, that move ended up filling this board up. What you have to end up doing, so just to, just to highlight that if you're interested, if you want to try that on your own, in this case, you would do x equals one half tangent of theta, when we would know that substitution because of this one plus u squared or a squared, or however you want to think about this. Um, so I would use that, and then I would get to a, a, a complicated trig integral, which would be secant cubed, which then you can use integration by parts and work that one out. And again, that's a ton of work. But really, I just want to say that all to emphasize the fact that almost always, unless somebody has given you a really nice set up function originally, it's very difficult to compute these by hands. Not to say you can't sometimes, but even often, like this one is set up so you could, often there's going to be like almost no technique to do it. And so we'll often use numerical techniques, again, using a computer to calculate it or approximation techniques for this integral. Okay, so I'm going to cop out a little bit. I'm not going to go down the gauntlet of trig substitution and then integration by parts in this example right here. But what I am going to do is use a known table. And so this right here, I recognize as being very similar to number 68 right here, where my a squared is the one. Um, what I'm going to do first is use a u substitution. I can think of either case here. I'm thinking what is squared to get this, but it's right there, it's 2x. So what I'm going to do is let u equal 2x, which means that du equals 2dx. I'll divide the two over to get 1 half du equals dx. So I will make that replacement here. Um, so then what I get is that this length is the integral. I'll need to change my, my uh, integral limits right here, is the square root of 1 plus u squared, and then du, when I bring that in, that substitution with dx, I get a one half out front. And then just to make those limit changes right here, it's pretty straightforward. u is just twice the size of x, so when x is zero, two times zero is zero. Um, when x is two, two times two is four. So I've made a quick change right there. Now what I'm going to do is write out this statement right here. Before I get there, I want to just make the note that in this case, um, a squared equals one, which means a equals one. There's really nothing else I need. I can plug this stuff straight in. So give me a second. I'll write this all out and we'll evaluate it. So again, all I've done from here to here was apply that form from number 68 right there. And it's exactly the same. I've just replaced the a's and a squareds with one. Um, and now I need to evaluate from four to zero, from zero to four. Um, what I'll do real fast is I'm going to erase that to give myself some room. I'll plug in a four and then plug in a zero and I still have this one half on the outside. All right, so let's plug this in and evaluate this thing. Uh, it won't end up really being that bad. Things get pretty nice when I plug in the zero, but here we go. So this first term, when I plug in four to all of this, so four divided by two is two, and then I'll do the square root fairly quickly. So four squared is 16 plus one. This becomes the square root of 17, and then plus one half the natural log of four plus uh, this one plus u squared, this is 17 again, so this is four plus the square root of 17. All right, now I need to subtract plugging in zero. Um, in this case, this first term right here is gonna automatically be zero because I get this factor of zero outside, so that's pretty nice. And then I have here plus one half, 
the natural log of zero plus the square root of one plus zero. This is just one. And then also to say here, um, when I'm getting, the only interesting thing I get in this term is the natural log of one, but actually the natural log of one is zero. So actually this whole thing, when I plug in the zero, um, goes to zero. So all I need to compute is this part right here. So what I'm gonna calculate is one half times two square root 17 plus one half the natural log of four plus the square root of 17. And uh, well, all I'm gonna do right now is plug that in my calculator to get a decimal approximation. And when I did that, I got 4.647 for the length of the curve of y equals or f of x equals x squared on the interval from zero to two. So that's really it. That's the entire coverage of this section generally. The most important thing you get out of this is this formula for finding the length of a curve. And classically, we don't do a bunch of examples with this because the honest truth is because of this formula the way it is and this being the simplest formula we have, almost every interesting function that you want to actually ca calculate the length of the curve using this technique is not easy to do at all. In fact, almost always you will use some kind of numerical approximation, or in this case, you can use a table to make your life a little bit easier or, or use a computer algebra system to do it for you.